higher hydraulic conductivity, and then the background network of less conductive fractured rocks well represented by uh, cells with lower hydraulic conductivity. So we're not modeling flow through individual fractures. However, we are making a, a, a putting into the model the zones of higher and lower hydraulic conductivity uh, in this rock. So here is a typical mod flow grid. Uh, the well field has been uh, turned around uh, slightly to fit better into the grid. And then if we want to look at a particular cross section, for example, right down the middle here, uh, we can do that. And basically, here's a vertical cross section. And the locations, these cells that are colored are locations where we have these high permeability zones. Now here I made an approximation and I flattened these zones out so that they fit in uh, more easily into the finite difference grid. But basically where we have these colored cells, are, those are the locations where we have these high permeability fractures. And surrounding these high permeability zone is this background of less permeable fractures that are represented by these uh, um, gray cells. Again, if we want to take a vertical, uh, a horizontal slice and look at it from the top, we'll see something like this. So here's a high permeability zone here. Here's another high permeability zone here, surrounded by less permeable rock. Now we kind of know more or less where this boundary is from the uh, cross hole measurements. But on the outside, we don't know exactly where this boundary is. So there's some guesswork. Uh, uh, involved in this modeling effort, and so there's some uncertainty involved. But basically what we wanted to know is uh, how well can this type of modeling approach uh, simulate flow uh, in, during a pump test in this type of uh, aquifer setting. And it turns out that actually you can do pretty well. Uh, here's the comparison between observed and simulated heads uh, drawdowns in one particular test. And you can see that the match is quite good. Now, if you use a standard method of uh, a homogeneous layer of aquifer, what you would most likely happen is that uh, you might be able to match one of these sets of data. But if you match, say, the uh, blue data, you won't be able to match the, the red ones or the yellow ones. And in order to match all the data simultaneously, we basically have to resort to a computer model, but not a very complicated one. In fact, a fairly simple one. Uh, when we calibrated this model, these are the results we get. For the cells that represent the fracture clusters, we get a hydraulic conductivity of about 6 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. Again, if you're not familiar with these type of units, this would be like a fine sand. Okay. Um, for the background network of fractures, we actually introduced some anisotropy. I won't get into the anisotropy, but just to point out that these values are about two to three orders of magnitude lower than these. So these would be, again, uh, typical of a silty material. So this block of rock, we can think of it hydraulically like a block of silty material with lenses of fine sand in it. Uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, actually, to see a simulation of one of these well tests to see how a uh, drawdown propagates in this type of rock. So I'm going to show you one of these simulations. Here's a cross section again. Uh, these black zones are the high permeability zones. I've turned off the colors because the colors are going to represent uh, drawdown distribution. The water table is here, and then these are the wells. Again, I'll simulate the, uh, the test where we use packers to isolate this particular location and pump from here. And you probably expect that since we're pumping from a high permeability zone, uh, drawdown will spread very quickly along this zone. And indeed, that's what we see in the field, and that's what we see in the computer model. So uh, only about one minute after we start pumping, we already see a response in this well 30 meters away. But then this zone ends. Uh, to, for the pressure to continue propagating, the water has to move through these less permeable rock. So it takes much longer to propagate beyond this zone. Uh, after 10 minutes, it hasn't gone very far. And it's only until uh, after about an hour that we start seeing a drawdown over here. And as soon as we see a drawdown in this well, because of this high permeability zone, we almost immediately see a drawdown over here. Uh, after about six hours, the drawdown distribution looks something like this. Then we can continue pumping and simulating. Uh, after about 100 hours, we get to a fairly steady distribution of drawdowns. Uh, we want to look at groundwater flow directions. 
uh, we can think of groundwater moving along the color spectrum from areas of low drawdown to areas of high drawdown. And what we see is that water is actually being drained from the water table. It's moving down from, actually this is a glacial deposit here, moving down into the bedrock, into these high permeability zones, and then flowing from one zone across to another high permeability zone and then gets pumped out. Some water actually flows from this high permeability zone down to this, this other one here, Coke moves back into this one, gets pumped out. So the net effect of these high permeability zones is that they are very effective collectors of water into wells if you can drill into one of them. Uh, and it's probably uh, easy to understand why if you miss one of these zones, if you just go you know, 10, 15 meters away, drill another well, you didn't hit one of these zones, you basically have a non-productive well. So I think these features uh, can explain why we see the drastically different uh, water yields in wells drilled in crystalline rocks. Another interesting thing that, uh, another thing that we want to uh, ask ourselves is, if we take this whole block of rock, what would be its effective hydraulic conductivity? Uh, so here we are asking uh, the effective hydraulic conductivity of on the 100 meter scale. And one way to answer this question, since we now have a model of this well field, is to do a computer exercise. What we can do is take a block out of this well field uh, and prescribe heads at opposite ends to set up a flow field and use the computer to actually simulate how water moves through this, this block of rock. So we do that. Uh, let's say we take this block of rock out because most of our data uh, are from here. Uh, put a head of 10 on this side, a head of zero on this side, no flow boundaries everywhere else. Uh, then we'll uh, have, a, have a setup where water is going to flow from this side over to this side. And we're going to let the computer simulate how the water gonna, is going to move through these high and low permeability zones. I think you probably know what the answer is. Um, if we draw, an, again, a cross section down this, the middle of this well field, uh, we see something like this. So here's the cro vertical cross section. These are the high permeability zones. A head of 10 here, zero here. And what we see is that most of the head gradient of the head drop is in these low permeability zones. So basically, water can move fairly quickly through these high permeability zones with very low gradients. But then these zones end and uh, the water has to move through these less permeable rock, we get all this head drop, and then until the water can move into another high permeability zone, it can move very fairly quickly. Again, some water from here actually can move down to here, moves out. So locally, over distances of tens of meters, the water you can move through fairly permeable rock, but over distances of, say, 100 meters, you've got to move through these bottlenecks. And so in this particular well field, it's really these bottlenecks that's controlling flow over larger distances. And now if we want to compute the hydraulic conductivity of this entire block of rock, we get a number uh, something close to 2 times 10 to the minus 7 meters per second. Now we want to make comparisons. We can take our results now and put it into this middle panel here. So what we see compared to the small scale test where we see all this variation, at the well field scales, we see clusters of fractures that are very permeable, but that's not the whole story. We also have this background network of less permeable fractures surrounding everything. There are two points here because I use an isotropy, but don't worry about that. Just think of this as one family. And if we take the whole block together, we end up with a hydraulic conductivity much closer to these less permeable fractures. That's because these are the bottlenecks, these are the, the features that are controlling flow over larger distances. So from the medium scale or the 100 meter scale investigations, what we find is that yes, these highly transmissive fractures actually connect with each other. Uh, they form clusters, but these clusters are only uh, tens of meters in extent and they are connected to one another via a network of less transmissive fractures. So that on the 100 meter scale, it's really these less transmissive network of fractures that controls fluid flow. We can ask the same question even on a larger scale. So suppose now we go up to the catchment or the drainage basin scale uh, of, say, a kilometer. Uh, what's the story there? 
So, well, let's go to look at the entire Mirror Lake drainage basin. And here what, we, what we'll do is to monitor the natural system. We can't uh, really do tests to make water move over distances of a kilometer. So we'll just look at the natural system. Rain is falling down into, onto land surface, soaking into the subsurface and moving through the subsurface. We'll monitor hydraulic heads and wells, and we'll monitor stream flow. Uh, extract the base flow portion, which is the groundwater discharge that gives us a estimate of how much water is moving through the subsurface. Uh, we can use geochemical analysis to help us infer the flow field. And we have been also doing some groundwater age dating to get an idea of how long this water has been in the ground. And then we'll use transport and flow modeling to try to tie everything together. Okay, this is the large scale model that we developed. The local Mirror Lake drainage basin is right around here, but we developed a larger model extending over a larger distance so that we can use uh, main topographic divides as uh, boundaries. So the idea here is drill wells in this area, measure the stream flows, and then use the data to calibrate a groundwater flow model. All our wells are set up with packers so that the well is divided into different sections for two reasons. One is we want to be able to measure heads at shallow portions of the bedrock and at deeper portions. Each section is connected by a tube uh, to a, a pipe, and we can measure the water level in the pipe. Another reason is uh, that if we leave the well open, water can move in through, let's say, a shallow fracture, move down the well, move into a deeper fracture. And basically, if you leave that open, you have a high permeability conduit. It will mix up the water chemistry. It will get very difficult to... Uh, to analyze. So we put the packers in to prevent uh, flow within the well bore. Here's a typical setup at the top of the well bore. Um, these are pipes sticking out. We measure water levels in these pipes. These are tubes used to inflate the packers. After we set everything up, we put a box over it and we use either floats or transducers to measure hydraulic heads. And we also put a number of shallow piezometers into the glacial material uh, to measure the heads in the shallower sections. So a typical setup looks something like this. Here's the bedrock. Bedrock well is divided into several sections depending on how many high permeability zones there are. And then a number of shallow wells drilled into the glacial drift. Uh, here's a typical set of data over a six month period. Uh, the shallower uh, heads, these are the heads in the shallow uh, piezometers in the glacial drift. You can see uh, individual storm events, and then in the springtime, basically the snow melts, the water level rises, and sometime in late April, early May, you, you start having a lot of evapotranspiration, all the recharge is used up, and the water level declines until the end of the summer, and everything starts all over again. Uh, in the bedrock, in the shallower parts of the bedrock, we see uh, some of the uh, responses similar to the shallower um, piezometers, but not the, the small-scale storms. But as, when we go deeper into the bedrock, we basically don't see uh, all the response from, from surface has been damped out. Okay, so using this data and also stream flow data uh, from uh, gauges that have been installed in these streams, we can extract the base flow portion, uh, estimate a groundwater discharge, and we use the, both the heads and the discharge to calibrate this groundwater model. Uh, on the large scale. And again, we decided to use a fairly simple model. Just use one value for hydraulic conductivity of the bedrock and one value for the hydraulic conductivity of the glacial material. And it turns out that, again, with a fairly simple model, we can actually match uh, observed heads pretty well. Uh, this is just one example of observed heads in the upper part of the bedrock and simulated heads. Uh, we don't have any data up here, so up at this corner is somewhat difficult to judge. But overall, we think we have a fairly decent match of hydraulic heads uh, between observed and simulated. And we've, when we calibrate the model to make this match, uh, we get a hydraulic conductivity for the large scale model right here, about 3 times 10 to the minus 7. So again, we can make the comparison. If we compare it to the uh, medium scale studies, what we find is that the large scale hydraulic conductivity is fairly similar to the entire block of uh, the well field rock. Um, 
So although we see all these variations when we get up to the large scale, the effective value is still pretty much controlled by these less permeable fractures, although there are local high permeability zones. In this particular area, these high permeability zones don't appear to extend over large distances, and therefore, even on the large scale, uh, we have something controlled by the less permeable rock. Now, I'm not saying that this response should be, uh, uh, or every case should be like this. There are lots of uh, cases where on the large scale, uh, you get a higher hydraulic conductivity because there exists uh, large permeability features that uh, you haven't sampled. But in this particular case, that does not ha seem to be the case. So I think uh, the, the message here is that uh, one shouldn't a priori assume that on the large scale, hydraulic conductivity would be higher or lower. Uh, it really depends on the particular site and the particular subsurface environment. Uh, finally, we've been using uh, CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, to get an estimate of how long the water has been in the subsurface. I think most of you are familiar with freons. Uh, it's a chemical that's used as refrigerants and solvents uh, since the 1940s, and the concentration has in the atmosphere has been increasing due to increased use, increased release. So the idea here is that a raindrop that fell down in 1960 would be in contact with an atmosphere uh, with a lot less freon than a raindrop that came down in 1980. This raindrop soaked into the ground, moved into the subsurface, and it's now shut off from the atmosphere. If we can go somewhere further down its flow path, capture the water, measure its freon concentration, we can come back and estimate how, when it recharged into the ground. So that's the basic idea. Um, now, the sampling procedure is somewhat complicated because the water sample can't touch the present day atmosphere. Uh, so Neil Plummer and Ed Busenberg, who developed this technique uh, in the USGS, has developed a way of uh, capturing the sample in a glass ampule and then you actually use a, a torch to flame weld uh, the neck of this ampule uh, to seal it and then we we'll bring it to the laboratory for analysis. Now, the idea is that if we have a simple hillside with a simple flow system, uh, water is infiltrating here, moving through the subsurface, exiting in the lake, we should see relatively young or recently recharged water near the uh, surface and high, up higher here. And as we follow the flow lines down to the discharge area, we should see older and older water. So ideally, that's what we would like to see. However, in the field, again, everything is more complicated than the ideal system. Uh, here is one cross section of, the, of a Mirror Lake hillside. Uh, first of all, the hillside is not flat, but has these local bumps. And uh, if we look at the distribution of ages, these points are places where we have collected samples, and the numbers are ages determined from the freon content. So basically, uh, for example, this point here, uh, the number 44 would mean that the freon concentration of this sample suggests that it uh, is consistent with rain that recharge. Uh, let's see, these samples collected in 1992, so 1948. So this, the concentration would be consistent with rainfall that w came down in 1948. Now we look at this distribution of ages, we see, well, some younger water, some older water, but then under this hump, we see some younger water again. So uh, perhaps uh, this hump causes a local flow system here and some younger water is introduced. More strangely, we see young water below older water. So again, in a fairly uh, complicated flow system, it might have take the water uh, longer to get there than to get here. And so if we look at this picture overall, what we see is that uh, travel times and travel paths are probably much more complicated in bedrock uh, compared to the distribution of heads. And our ability to um, simulate these types of travel times at this point is unclear. We are still working with this data. This is really uh, um, uh, a presentation of what we see in the field. Uh, we haven't done a thorough analysis uh, of these data yet. Okay, so findings from the kilometer scale investigation, what we find is that uh, it, when we determine the hydraulic conductivity on the kilometer scale, it's quite similar to the hydraulic conductivity of the 100 meter 
uh, block that we see in the well field, suggesting that although uh, we see these high permeability zones, they're not uh, connected over large distances, and flow at the kilometer scale is probably in this site controlled by the network of less transmissive fractures. Uh, when we look at the spatial distribution of groundwater ages, we find that uh, we expect that flow paths through the bed bedrock and travel times are probably highly complex. Uh, in conclusion then, uh, let me just reiterate my uh, first point that I brought up in, the, in this presentation. That is, at least in water resources and, and uh, contamination types of problems, uh, I think the main problem in a fractured rock uh, kinds of setting is how to deal with a very high degree of heterogeneity. In most cases, uh, the major features such as high transmissivity fracture zones or low permeability dikes that are large on the scale of your study site will have to be individually identified and characterized uh, through a combination of uh, geophysics testing, geological knowledge, geochemistry. Uh, however, we can only measure so many things so that the network of minor, less transmissive fractures will probably have to be characterized in terms of effective properties. Uh, we find that a multidisciplinary approach is really needed. Uh, each approach will give us a somewhat fuzzy picture of the subsurface, and it's by putting the different fuzzy pictures together that we can see a clearer picture. Also, if we are able to make measurements at different scales, then we can start to understand how the smaller scale measurements compare to the larger scale properties. Uh, finally, we find that at least for uh, simulating heads and fluxes, that a standard groundwater model works quite well. Uh, what we have to do is to find out where these contrasting properties are, where the high permeability zones are, where the low permeability zones are, when we can put that into the model, uh, we can actually simulate heads and fluxes pretty well. However, when we get to transport, and uh, when we think, uh, when we are dealing with travel times, uh, travel paths, then I think the heterogeneity really uh, uh, makes the problem uh, quite difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, at this point, I think transport and fractured rocks uh, remains a research topic that is uh, very challenging for us. And I hope that uh, in the near future, uh, we and other researchers will uh, be able to uh, uh, bring some uh, additional results that I can share with you. Thank you very much. For more information on groundwater resources or to obtain additional copies of this videotape presentation, write NGWA Order Department, 2600 Groundwater Way, Columbus, Ohio, or phone 1-800-551-7379, attention Jackie Mack.